Thanks for all of you that have shown up tonight uh, to celebrate and hear the history of uh, 100 years of the uh, Bloomington Speedway. I think the Bloomington Speedway, and I'll be corrected here in a minute, is one of the oldest uh, speedways in the uh, state of Indiana. In fact, in my book, it's number three behind uh, the uh, 500 and, uh, and um, Mount Pelier. Uh, Mount Pelier started as a horse racing track. But anyway, let's get to our, our speakers uh, tonight. Uh, we have two of the very best uh, known uh, sprint car announcers in the uh, uh, whole United States, Pat Sullivan and uh, Brad Dickinson. Uh, they'll take us back into the 100 years of the history of the Speedway, where there was a half mile track and uh, Brad, Brad is a second generation Speedway um, uh, family. Brad's father, Bob, was a uh, very fine racer and owner, uh, won uh, championships uh, in the uh, 70s at uh, Mount Vernon. North Vernon. Uh, North Vernon uh, yeah. Speedway, yes. And um, I knew Bob better uh, as a uh, high school athlete in 1961, his uh, high school team won the IHSA State Cross Country Meet, and Bob was kind of the leader of that particular team. Uh, in fact, the coach of that team, uh, would give a coach a different uh, one, but the real coach, happy to be John Brad. And Brad gets his name from uh, John, the coach. John also coached me in college, so we have uh, connections that way. <coughs> Uh, but Bob was probably was better known for uh, building uh, race cars. Maybe some of you uh, have seen the uh, cars. He, he built some of the best uh, cars in the United States uh, during that period of time. And um, Brad carried uh, on his father's interest in both high school sports and in uh, uh, racing. Uh, he, uh, Bob, has, uh, or excuse me, Brad, uh, has uh, been a coach of uh, teams that have played in the Final Four at the IHSA level, and he has announced uh, for over four, uh, 30 years for more than 100 uh, Indy car races as well. At present, he's a t-shirt uh, and golf coach. I don't know about that one, but uh, <laughs> anyway, he's uh, retiring from uh, basketball. Um, and uh, he, uh, he paired up with uh, Pat in uh, 1963, and uh, they've been all over the uh, country. At present, he works in Bloomington and the Lincoln uh, Park uh, in Putnamville. Pat went on, uh, went to see a baseball game, as I understand, while he was uh, doing his uh, PhD work at uh, uh, University or Kansas University, and it was postponed because of heat. So what did he do? He went down the road a few. Uh, a little ways to the uh, speedway, and they ran that night. And uh, he uh, he quickly uh, <coughs> picked up an interest in uh, racing. Uh, he liked what he saw. He became stru struck by the culture of the uh, sport, and found that uh, he wanted to be a part of it. <coughs> After a, st a stint uh, studying uh, or as a professor at uh, Southwest. Missouri State, uh, he uh, chose Indiana uh, IUPUI in Indianapolis to be his uh, home uh, base because it was close to uh, the racist, uh, racist of the news. Is that right? That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and thanks to the reference of uh, his uh, friend, uh, Tony Stewart, who uh, gave a good um, uh, accolations to the uh, Bloomington Speedway. He became the announcer along with uh, Corey Pittman for one year and then the next year Brad joined him and they've been together for over th uh, 30 years. He claims that Brad has a better voice but he himself has a, so much knowledge that he is sometimes called the Donald Davidson of the street car race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, that's what it says. <laughs> and that got him in uh, uh, 2017 inducted into the uh, National uh, Streetcar Hall of Fame, Knoxville, uh, Iowa. Uh, Pat is uh, the uh, Associate Dean of the Indiana University Center for Social 
uh, health and well-being, and it directs the uh, faculty development at the School of uh, Social Work. You can see these guys are pretty busy fellows. I, I, I'm trying to find out some of the information on my God, how do they have another life? But Pat uh, has been distinguished in many honors. He's been the distinguished uh, future uh, uh, award, outstanding University of uh, Kansas alumni, and the same more on the Wabash, and many, many other uh, awards. Brad and um, Pat will give us uh, their knowledge of the 100 years of the Speedway. Guys? Thank you guys so much for coming today, and uh, wow, it is awesome to be here. Um, as I look out at this crowd, and I know, Pat, you feel this way too, uh, many of you have loved and, and enjoyed your Friday nights more years than Pat and I have, and I feel like we've been there for forever. So many of you have enjoyed the Bloomington Speedway since the 50s, the 40s, and you know the heroes that we love so much, and uh, we continue to watch on our Friday nights, including this Friday at the Josh Burton Memorial. So we're so glad you guys are here. Before we get started just a little, I definitely want to make sure I introduce some of our dignitaries, our special families. All of you are special, but some of the special families that are here. Uh, with us in the front here, we have Trudy Mitchell Wright, of course, the daughter of Hall of Famer Rex Mitchell. How about a round of applause? Nice to have you, Trudy. The gentleman that had the foresight to hire Pat and then bring me along a, a year or two later, Mike Miles, after 25 years. Mike, good to have you. Uh, Nat Hill, uh, the third, the grandson, of course, of the gentleman who started the Speedway in 1923, uh, is not here with us yet, but we appreciate their family, and of course, the there you go, Nat. Hey! <laughs> That's great. Much appreciated. Uh, Tom White, of course, uh, is sitting, where did I, I lost Tom, hey Tom, it's great to have you here again tonight, and of course, Tom has been a car owner and a Speedway sponsor and just involved in so many things. Uh, earlier today, Justin Fox was here. Uh, he's finishing up a round of golf. We hope to see him back here in just a little bit. But uh, he's brought a, one of the beautiful pictures, the very first picture, I think, that we can find of the Speedway. And then also tomorrow is bringing some things at the uh, presentation for the car show tomorrow, including the limestone uh, special that he brought of the rocking chair of cards. So we're looking forward to seeing that. Uh, here, for, uh, the executive and curator of the Knoxville Hall of Fame, Tom Schmay, has joined us. Tom, it's great to have you here. And also the current promoters of the Bloomington Speedway, Joe and Jill Spiker, our current bosses. So uh, we thank all of you for being here. This Happy could be the end. This could be the end of our career. But <laughs> they might be looking for new announcers tomorrow or for Friday night, but we sure hope not. Um, again, when I got the call uh, to come down and do this a few months ago, I just was so excited. One, because it was Marshall Goss, somebody my dad and his friends as track coaches and people always talked about it much like our drivers that maybe we don't know, that was a name that meant a lot to me. And so when I came home and there was a message, hey, Marshall Goss called, I was like a little kid. And so to get to talk with him and, and for him to ask for Pat and I to come down here meant an awful lot. And uh, you know, so we appreciate Marshall, you asking us to be here. Pat, I don't even really know um, all the different stories where we go with this, but I think it's so important that the, rel the relevance of the Speedway and, and the standing of the Speedway is so deep in tradition uh, here. And uh, I know that that's Pat's specialty, as you guys know. He's an unbelievable storyteller, and uh, I always love hearing his stories. And Pat, this Speedway is just amazing. It is. In fact, when I saw Mike, I remember this vividly. Mike may not remember this, but uh, the, the story that was told is actually very true. I began my nascent career in Missouri, and I very much wanted to um, uh, continue. Uh, I did. I did take a job at Indiana University because it was a Big Ten school and it was a, it was a career progression. But honestly, uh, I was offered a job at the University of Illinois Chicago and Washington University of St. Louis at the same time. Uh, I think you can see why it was a pretty easy choice to choose Indiana, to where I wanted to, wanted to go. But the story, as was alluded to, some of you know the story. It's in print. I don't have to hide it now. But uh, I was announcing an I-44 Speedway in Missouri, and Tony Stewart won his very first ever USAC Sprint Car Race, made a high side pass on Robbie Stanley in turn three, and Steve Christman in the order from Columbus, Indiana's car. And 
I'm on the track to do the interview, and I said, uh, and Tony's sitting in the car, and I said, hey, Tony, we're doing an interview, and he says, uh, I, 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 can't, I can't get out of the car. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, I, I peed my pants on the parade. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, Tony, you got a black uniform. You're ways away from the stands. Nobody's going to see and he comes out. So those of you, I know a lot of people have intersected with Tony. So the next time you said came down, I, I went up to him and I said, hey, Tony, I got really great news. I got a spare pair of pants in my car should anything go awry. And those of you know Tony, he put together 12 of the most creative swear words I've ever heard in my life <laughs> that ended with me being a jerk. Uh, but I did see him at the Chili Bowl and I told him I was moving to Indiana and he gave me uh, two names. Actually, he, he, he got a hold of Sandy Lowe. Sandy Lowe's dad, Bob Lowe, was the owner of the very first Chili Bowl winner with Rich Vogler at the controls, longtime UMRA TQ owner. And, and Larry Martz, who Tony lived with, was there and said, call Sandy Lowe and maybe get out with TQs. But I wrote Mike sight unseen. Where's Mike at? I can't. Oh, I see him now. So I wrote Mike sight unseen, and he, he invited me uh, to join Carrie Pittman, the, the announcer. But I had my very first interview um, there to talk with them. And like everybody else that I would tell ever again, which was say, listen, when you go to Bloomington Speedway, you're gonna think you're lost, but you're not. <laughs> well, I was sure I was lost. And now it's taken longer than I thought, and I'm late, which I'm, I'm, I'm really a punctual guy, so I'm like, Pat, real quick, you were driving from Kansas, if I'm not no, mistaken. No, I, 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 I drove from Indianapolis this time, but when I first started, I was going back and forth from, from Springfield, Missouri to announce because I wanted to. But I remember I'm mortified, and I, I pulled up. I'll never forget this. I pulled up the driveway, and I saw that racetrack. I saw that red clay. It was a beautiful fall day. The trees were, like, turned on the back, and I just went, I, I just fell in love right? Some of you have done this, right? That's never changed. I mean, that has never changed. Every time I go to that racetrack, I fall in love with it. So big thanks to Mike for making that uh, decision. Pat, the other day, uh, Doug Van Deventer, who was here, uh, texted me before a race on a Friday night and said, you know, when you and Pat go to the booth, take a deep breath and sit in your seat and realize where you are. This is one of the greatest places you could be. Enjoy the red clay and the beautiful green grass and just the things that make Bloomington Speedway so special. You can go there as school teachers with a frustrating day, an upset child that got me in the wrong spot. But I agree, Doug, when I get there and I look out through the window at our PA booth and just go, this is awesome. This is a yeah. great place. Yeah, to add to that, one of, my, one of my favorite memories actually was a couple years ago. It was the last race of the year. And um, I had my car was parked down in the bottom parking lot. Many of you have walked up the hill to the parking lot. Many of you know when you go into the gate, there's a great big tree that's right there, and it's got a Smokey the Bear sign on it, right? I've always, I've always loved that. And I remember I was standing there, and I was looking at that tree, and the leaves were rustling, and it's late. And I went, you know what? That tree has been here about as long as this speedway has been here. And it's going to be here long after I'm not a part of this speedway. At least that's my hope, that that old tree has looked over that speedway. And I always would think to myself, it's much like that big tree that used to be the first turn of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which they cut down, which makes me mad. Uh, I, I, I take a look at that tree and I think, my God, how much history has gone in front of that tree over the years. And that's one reason why we're celebrating 100 years of moving the speedway. Yes, very well said. We're going to start a little bit here, and, and Pat's got the great notes of the early times at the Bloomington Speedway with champions and the early times. Of course, I think most of us in here are much more versed in the 50s, 60s, all the way through today. But, Pat, I know you've got some amazing notes yeah. uh, from the uh, very beginning of the Bloomington Speedway and the first champions and winners. And, um, of course, we do have a picture. Um, I forget exactly where it's made. It's over there by the lemonade and the water. Make sure you stop out and see that. But... Uh, an amazing picture of that year. And Pat, uh, you know, those are names that uh, have made Bloomington Speedway 100 years later what it is today. It is, no question about that. Yeah. Ready? I'm ready. All right. So, you know, I'm going to go through some of this relatively quickly. The, the one thing I want to say is, is that here's one reason I really like that we're doing this. 
because this should be getting the ball rolling because much of what we're discussing now to use a research term is a hypothesis. I always tell my students when I begin a class each year, I say, you know what, 100 years from now, some of the stuff I'm gonna tell you are gonna be proved to be absolutely bunk because we learn, we get smarter, we know, we grow, we learn. And there are gaps in the history of Livingston Speedway because the Speedway also had gaps itself. So I do realize that some of what we're doing now is an exploration. And one of my hopes, and I've made this uh, statement to Doug, is that we, you go back east and, and tracks like Williams Grove and Lincoln, they do a wonderful job on their website. You can look at every champion. You can look at almost every race winner. They've kept accurate totals of the number of wins. We haven't done that. Uh, I've worked hard to get champions as far as I can. So I would like to think that this is a little bit of, of a work in progress. And then we'll get smarter, we'll fill in blanks as we go along. But one of the things that I, I, I do like to provide is a little context for you. So, and there's a reason for this. In 1909, Indiana ranked second only to Michigan in the number of cars produced. Now many people forget that. But Marmon, Stutz, National, Duesenberg, and more were built in Indiana, and in Indianapolis in particular. As of 1919, there were 172 companies building cars or car parts in more than 30 cities and towns in Indiana. Okay, so we know that that's one of the reasons why the Indianapolis Motor Speedway was built in 1909 as a, as a testing ground. Okay, great. We all love, we all love the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but what does it have to do with Bloomington Speedway? And I have a story about that. It's 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 one of my favorites. There's probably a few of you other than Brad and I who knew the late John Cooper. John Cooper was a remarkable human being. Uh, he was the president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He was the president of Daytona. He was on the board of International Speedway Corporation. He was on the board of ACUS, the Competition Committee for the Americas that deals with international events. John Cooper was a short track racing fan. He grew up in Iowa, and in fact, his very first job was working in the concession stand, I think at the CMAR Bowl in Iowa. When his boss asked him why he wanted to be in the concession stand, he said, I want to be closer to the cars. And he loved racing, and he loved midget racing in particular. But John was just a remarkable guy. He traveled to the South, I think it was Birmingham, Alabama, for an IMCA sprint car race near the end of the year. He's standing next to legendary promoter um, Al Sweeney, you know, one of the absolute legends of the sport. And the stands are packed. And so he says, Al, why do you think people come to these events? And Al Sweeney looked at him and said, John, it's the reflected glory of the Indianapolis 500. And so the impact of the Indianapolis 500 is far and wide, but it's particularly so in Indiana. Because I can tell you this, you know, uh, we have basketball fans here and people involved in sports, right? I'm from Kansas. You might recall we won the national championship this year, my <laughs> alma mater. I, I know it hurts, but I'm an IU faculty member. I die with them too. But basketball, is basketball part of the, the cultural fabric of Indiana? Well, you bet it is. Is auto racing? You bet it is. It may be more than any other place in the country is this part of who we are and what we mean and what we do. And so, you know, one of the things that if we, if we go back in time, if you go back to the early days of auto racing, and, and particularly if we want to use more sprint car kind of racing, there were two major sanctioning bodies in America, right? The AAA, American Automobile Association, and the IMCA. Those were the two heavyweights, right? And they covered much of the country. But you know what? They didn't cover it all, now did they? They didn't. Because throughout our area and throughout our region, there were all sorts of racetracks, many, many, many fairgrounds racetracks and little tracks. You know, we had a problem at Lincoln Park Speedway last Saturday night, and we had temporarily had to take some push trucks and push them into turn three and turn the lights on to illuminate the third turn. And I made the comment over the PA that there were jalopy tracks all over the nation that did just that every time they raced that are lost to history. 
nobody knows where, you know, where they were or where they went. But just taking a look at things here, you know, obviously by the 1920s, Winchester Speedway is in operation. We mentioned what was happening to Montpelier, but there were some other ones that were really important. There were two tracks in Brazil, Indiana, and one was called Sunflower Speedway. There was a one mile track near Terre Haute called Black Demon Speedway. There was George Rogers Clark Speedway, which was right across from Ben Sins, probably technically in Illinois. Sullivan Speedway, Sullivan, Indiana had a speedway. And of course, there was the legendary Jungle Park. How many of you have ever been to Jungle Park out of curiosity? Listen, folks, let me just tell you, I read an article by the, the great photographer and Hall of Famer, John Mahoney, in an old publication called Racing Cars, where he had an article about Jungle Park, and I'd read it. And years later, when I was coming to Indiana for the 500, I went, there's no way that racetrack's still here, but I'm gonna go look. It's right north of Rockville, Indiana on 41. A lot of people forget this. 41 used to be the main artery between Chicago and Miami, okay? So I came around a corner and I saw that grandstand and I saw Jungle Park written on the back of it. It just took my breath away. And you can still go there and see that grandstand and you can still see the contour of that racetrack. And it was a legendary racetrack. Now some of these places, these races we called the suicide circuit. And frankly, for good reason, probably. The facilities were sometimes crude, they had board fences, they were particularly safe, but there were legendary drivers who raced there. And guess what? Bloomington Speedway is one of those racetracks, built in 1923. So, we have Wiley and Kent Carter, and Nat U. Hill, Nat U. Hill Jr. built the track on land owned by James Mitchell, right? So let's take a look at these guys. And I'm happy that we have a member of the Hill family here. This is a remarkable family, remarkable, and remarkable for this community. I mean, it's just tremendous. Nat Sr. was the president of the First National Bank of Bloomington. He was an Indiana state treasurer. He was an Indiana University benefactor and trustee. He was the chairman of the Republican Party. And I just touched the surface. And Nat Sr. passed in 1908. The individual who was involved in Bloomington Speedway was his son, born in 1881. He took over as president of the bank eventually, not immediately. He was also president of the College Avenue Motor Sales, which was a Chevrolet dealer. Now that's pretty early on, right? He was also active he was the head of the Bloomington Home Guards during World War I. How about that? He was active in the Empire Stone Company where his brother Philip was also active. But unfortunately, while the Speedway was built in 1923, he died of a heart attack in Palm Beach in 1924. Now, I, I honestly don't have much on Kent Carter. But Wiley Carter, who was the track manager in 1924, now this guy is something else. Right? Born in 1895, he died here in 1971. He was a World War I veteran. He was a former automobile dealer. He was also an air pioneer. I found a piece in the Indianapolis Star that he attended an aviation school in Indianapolis. He's believed to be the first person in Bloomington ever to own an airplane, the first occupant at the airport, the first to land in the city limits, the first to take aerial pictures of the city, and he became a commercial pilot. That all worked out for him until he crashed in Indianapolis in 1928 and said, that's enough of that. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to talk with these people? I mean, these are remarkable human beings who build the racetrack. And Brandon had discovered that some of the interest was also in horse racing, but Bloomington Speedway was born. I believe that Nat and his group still continue to run horses right. at, the, at, the, um, at Shelbyville, and they're quite successful. And Matt, we hope you win the next couple of great races. <laughs> are, you ready, are you ready for that? Okay. Well, that can change. Yeah. Right. So let's take a look at some of the early winners, okay? I'm going to do this as quickly as I can, but it's fascinating to me. First winner, winner, as far as I know, is Ray Butcher. Ray Butcher won on the 22nd of September, 1923, in the Ray Butcher R&B Special. Harry Ward was second. John Huff was second. Ray also won a 30-lap event. 
He was born in 1897. So when you think about that, the first people who wanted this racetrack were born in the 1800s. That's how deep this history grows. He graduated from Arsenal Tech High School in Indianapolis at a time not when all many people graduated from high school. He began working on upholstering cars, but he eventually opened up his own garage. Now, on September 6, 1924, he won a 100-lap feature at Bloomington at a time of 59 uh, minutes and 47 seconds. The sad story, it's a suicide circuit. He was killed the very next race, the next day, in Rochester, Indiana. And a fundraiser was held for him in Rochester. Wally Butler, he won on October 27, 1923 in the Clemens Special. 46 minutes, 50 seconds. Finishing third in that race was the 1931 Indianapolis 500 winner, Louis Schneider. How about that? Wally was born in 1898 in Erie, Pennsylvania. He worked as a mechanic for Stutz. He was in the U.S. Navy during World War I. He was a riding mechanic, twice running in the Indianapolis 500. He was an occasional mechanic, riding mechanic on board tracks, for those of you who know the board track era, and he failed to qualify for the 1924 Indianapolis 500. In 1924, we have a winner, Charles Dutch Bauman, National Sprint Car Hall of Fame inductee, one of the all-time greats, also with the AAA and IMCA. Born in 1927 in Indianapolis, born in 1897 in Indianapolis, perished in a crash at Kankakee, Illinois in 1930. But by 1928, who was he racing for? Arthur Chevrolet. How many races did he win, reputedly? 43 in 52 starts. He competed in the Indianapolis 500 in 1927. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a giant in the sport of auto racing. Now here comes my personal favorite, I have to tell you. This is a guy who apparently was leading in 1923 and crashed on the last lap and finished well up in another race. His name was Hilton Crouch. Hilton Crouch won on Memorial Day, 1925. Okay, this is literally one of my favorite stories. He was born in 1903, and he was reported to be the 1925 champion at Hoosier Speedway, which was located at the time at 38th and Pendleton Pike in Indianapolis, but now it's really Massachusetts Avenue. And there, there were a host of legendary racers who competed there. He also won a race against the Indianapolis motorcycle police officer, Louis Schneider, the Indianapolis 500 winner. Okay, so this is all going well, and he wins on Memorial Day 1925. But then things went awry for poor Hilton Crouch. By December, he was arrested for the theft of four tires. Not good. In mid-1926, he was identified as a participant in a payroll heist of the Duesenberg Motor Company. Not good. <laughs> Following a shootout with Chicago police, he was sentenced to 18 months in Joliet, and upon release, he was identified as the driver of the bandit car in the Duesenberg job. Not good. Not good. <laughs> but where he really found his work... He was the driver for John Dillinger. <laughs> he was at the wheel for several robberies, including the State Bank of Massachusetts Avenue. He was arrested in 1933 in a restaurant he co-owned <laughs> under assumed name. He confessed to the crimes and got a 20-year term. Now, there is a good part of this story. Hilton Crouch reportedly earned an electrical engineering degree while in prison, and upon release, he opened the Crouch Electric Company on East 18th Street in Indianapolis. Let's hear it for Hilton Crouch. <laughs> he turned his life around. He lived until 1976. Bill McCoy. Bill McCoy won on June 26, 1927, and on 7-17-1927 in the Arnold Johnson Green Devil. He was from Sullivan, Indiana, a sparkling record, but had a brief career. In 1927, he won five of six races at Jungle Park. In fact, he was reported to have won 32 races that year and won a total of $10,000 in prize money. I don't have to tell you what $10,000 was in 1927. 
That year, he won at Jungle Park, Black Demon, Sunflower, George Rogers Clark, the Suicide Circuit, and he also had a big year in 1928, but he married, decided to retire, and became a successful businessman. If he would have continued racing, would he have been a member of the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame? Quite likely. How about Ira Hall, National Sprint Car Hall of Fame inductee? One on the 30th of May, Memorial Day, 1927. Made five starts in the Indianapolis 500. Born in Martinsville, didn't start racing till he was 30, but was soon known as the King of Jungle Park. It's claimed that he started over 700 races and suffered over 50 broken bones in his career. He started the 500 five times, beginning in 1928. His last start in 1939, he was 47 years old. Upon retirement, he was the deputy county of Vigo County from 1943 to 1949, and ultimately owned his own tire store. So as we look, I'm going to take us up to a little ways, but here's the thing or the point I'm trying to make. From the very beginning, these were legendary drivers who were racing here and winning at this racetrack. I mean, they may be lost to history. They may not be in the bold lights that some who won the Indianapolis 500 did in that particular time, but these were championship caliber drivers. So let's just move really quickly to the post-war era. When we think about the post-war era at uh, Flemington Speedway, we think about a couple of groups. One, the Central States Racing Association, um, anchored in, in Dayton, uh, Ohio. Doug even has a program from a Bloomington Speedway event in 1949 or 1948. A, 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 an incredibly tough circuit. The Midwest Dirt Track Association was a group that was known by a lot of people as the kerosene circuit. They raced at Franklin, Indiana, Columbus, Indiana, crossover into Illinois, and in 1948, they ran three times in Indiana. But one of the things that happened in the middle of this whole enterprise after World War II involves Diz Wilson. Now, how many of you know about the legendary Diz Wilson, right? I mean, this is literally one of the greatest characters this sport has ever seen. He has had the great statement that it's easier to change drivers than it is to change gears. That's what Daryl Tate's done for years. I mean, he's, he knows all about that. But Cantankerous Diz Wilson was born in Abbeydale, Indiana, married his wife, Zell, who was 15 year old when they married, had probably 100 drivers, and the list of drivers who were involved in terms of Hall of Fame is as long as my arm. I mean, he was unbelievable. He, had a tie, he spent some time at the Speedway, IMS Speedway. He was legendary for going through the dumpsters and the trash cans and finding parts. His cars were usually orange or yellow. There was a Carpenter school bus factory across the street from Diz. How he got yellow paint for his cars, no one knows, but that's what they looked like. And he was the master of the Ranger engine. The Ranger was an aircraft engine. It was a very powerful, and he made it work. But Wayne Padgett, who was a Midwest Dirt Track Racing Association champion, and Diz reconfigured Bloomington Speedway more to the form that you see it today. They actually set a tent and worked on that racetrack. And Diz was very much, Diz, Diz built a track in Mitchell, Indiana. He was involved in Salem, Indiana. He helped with the track in Martinsville. Beyond what he did as a mechanic as an owner, uh, he was involved in that construction. Now, some of you might have been there, but my recollection is, is that when Diz passed away, he was buried in his casket. He had a wrench in one hand and a shop rag in the other. Now, how do you like that? Isn't that fantastic? But in the, MDR, the MDTRA was the brainchild of a guy named from Greenwood, Indiana, named Dan Sheik, Jr., and a guy named Dan Wycliffe. I mean, it was Don Wycliffe. He owned a, at the time, he was parking cars at the Columbia Club in downtown Indianapolis, but eventually the family owned a cleaners, and this is where most of the drivers of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway got their uniforms cleaned. In fact, in a memorabilia show two years ago, I saw a laundry bag from the cleaners. He has a great-grandson who was an official with the Indy 11 soccer team. And I notified him, and the guy went over there and bought this particular laundry bag for his collection. So we have those two groups 
primarily race in there. And I'll go through this quickly. When you think about you know, some of the people that, that raced here. First of all, you know, 1948. Who wins on the 6th of June? Bobby Grin. Bobby Grin. You know, and, and I think many of you here know the connection here. I mean, Bobby Grimm was from Coal City, Indiana. First race was at Jungle Park. He wore a coal miner's helmet, uh, for a coal helmet for his automobile helmet. His He had a car called Chucklehead, which he built. But he was good enough to catch the attention of a guy named Hector Hernori. At the time, Hector Hernori's car was a yellow car called the City of Roses. Cliff Griffith, who's one of the most underrated and appreciated race drivers of that time had been a champion, was the driver, but wanted to get to Indianapolis and wanted to go to AAA. And Bobby Graham ultimately got that seat. Bobby Graham set the IMCA on fire in Hector Honore's number two, simply on fire. Hector from Pena, Illinois. Um, just, it was a fabulous, fabulous partnership. Bobby ultimately wanted to go to Indianapolis. He was the rookie year in 1959. He won at Syracuse, New York on the championship trail in 1960. His crew chief was Dave Laycock. Many of you know the infamous Theo Laycock. Dave Laycock was his brother. His uh, Dave's father was the longtime historian at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So again, you have Bobby Grimm. You have, you have Wally Stokes, a winner. He's a former champion of the series. You have Glenn Pee Wee Northern, the 1949 CSRA champion. They won at the Speedway. So what I'm trying to tell you is the beat just went on with the Central States Racing Association. Sid Bufkin, born in Mark Carmel, Illinois, 1926. I visited his grave a couple of years ago. Uh, served in the U.S. Navy in World War II. Started in midgets. Raced for Diz in a Ranger-powered car. Was a two-time champion in the SCRA. Killed in 1952 at Fort Wayne after he'd won the championship. Outstanding racer. Sid won a 100-lap race at Bloomington Speedway. He won in 1952. Leon Hubble from Linton, Indiana, a winner in 1949. Leon was an outstanding racer. My great friend, the late Joy Ray, told me that Leon, he stayed in the house with Leon, which it must have had some sort of circle, and he said at night, Leon would roller skate all the way around through the house. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, so, you know, 1956, we go back and it's Bobby Green. Oh, by the way, I didn't complete my thought on that. Many of you know this story, but I'll, I'll tell it quickly anyway. So um, Bobby Graham had a really pretty good friend named Frank Lepto. Frank Lepto was from Wisconsin, and he was a uh, tank operator in World War II. Uh, Frank was the very first uh, uh, fast time at the Terre Haute Action Track. Number one, he set fast time in the very first race there. That year... He was killed at Lakewood Speedway in, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, in his stock car. So his wife, Betty, was left a widow with a young child named Susie. He went back to work at the family restaurant in Tampa, Florida, and one day in walked Bobby Grimm and in walked Merle Heath, his car owner. A romance was established. Betty Grimm ultimately married Bobby, and the Susie you know is Susie Kinzer who was married to Sheldon Kenzer. Some of this stuff simply goes full circle. He also, in 1956, by the way, I'll, I'll move to Brad on this one. He won on what was reported to be the coldest day in the history of Bloomington on that date, and I checked, the temperature was in the 30s. So again, I want to make the same point. Sid Bufkin, Bobby Grant, Wayne Padgett, these drivers, all of them are legendary drivers. Many of them are members of the Sprint Car Hall of Fame. And ultimately, as we go forward, we'll let Brad take over for a little bit here. As you well know, in 1961, though it took a while to, to get going, the, the South Central Indiana Racing Association was formed, and we'll kind of move from there. Well, I tell you, Pat, those were amazing yeah. stories and, and, and things that uh, it's amazing that you remember all of that so well. <laughs> I know you had your notes there, but to, to, bring us to, to bring us to this point, where we now move into where I think many of us here are, are more familiar, but yet understand the history that was behind us. And of course, we have the Mitchells here, and, and so many of I've already talked to some of our fans that are here 
that uh, you know it was Dick Gaines, it was Butch Wilkerson, it was John Krebs, who it seems like every week, uh, I believe it's his uh, grandson wins the 50-50, and we always have the hard charger of the race and $100 uh, in, in memory of John Krebs. But, um, you know, it just, the list goes on, and I was so fortunate, young in, in my age, you know, to meet many of those drivers. Dick Gaines drove a car that my dad uh, had built late in his career. And, um, and was, you know, was still powerful with what he did. Butch Wilkerson, Alan Barr, a very close friend of my dad's that I spent a lot of time with, that gentleman. And uh, those were great memories and helped me uh, get my love for this sport. And I think that's why many of you are here because those legends that we looked up to and continue to look up to bring us to the racetrack every Friday night. And uh, the stories are amazing. I believe over an adult beverage or two, the stories continue to get even bigger. <laughs> Um, the victories get even more important um, and who we beat. But one of the things I always hear, um, you know, I was with a, a friend of my dad's um, that was in the top 10 in points in, in, the, in this division. And uh, we were at a um, showing, a, a celebration of life for Bob McDaniel, a good family friend who passed away this past weekend. And he said the respect with the drivers was amazing. And how you earn that respect with those champions, of course, was brought down with the Rex Mitchells and the Dick Gaines and the Bob Kensers, you were taught respect in the right way. And uh, Bloomington Speedway was such a big part of that. Uh, the way that track, you have to run it. Uh, to this day, some people are scared to run Bloomington Speedway. It's a tough man's track. Uh, Tyler Courtney, a good friend of ours, um, did not like it for many years because it bit him a time or two. But at the same time, if you could master Bloomington Speedway, uh, you could run just about anywhere. And it is a, an elbows up track, as we like to say today. And, and Pat, those drivers that came through there in the 60s and 70s, and I know many of them, as you said, in the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame, right. it is a who's who, uh, a list of drivers. And uh, it is simply amazing uh, what we've been able to continue to carry on. Right, just, to, just out of curiosity, because some of these names will mean something more to some of you than do me, because you're from this area and you, you know this. Uh, I think it was Doug that, that shared a, a piece with me. Uh, when the uh, SEIRA was organized, president was Roscoe Brewington from Bloomington. Vice president, Johnny Johnson from Bloomfield. Didn't Johnny race for 117 years, didn't yes, he? he did. Oh, he's a beautiful number yeah. 72. He did. Treasurer was Frank Knight from Bloomington. Ron Hughes, an attorney, uh, was involved. The board of directors were Pete Brewer from Valonia. You know, and I, the Brewer family is still very much involved in racing. Diz Wilson, James Maxville. Uh, from Martinsville, Harry Hollers from Bloomington. Have we heard the Hollers name at Bloomington Speedway? You bet we have. And Rex Mitchell from Bloomington. Ed Shepard was involved, obviously, with Paragon Speedway, and Lawrence and Clyde Fox were also involved. Lawrence was a fine furniture uh, uh, store owner here in Bloomington. Champions, uh, uh, you know, for a while it was a three race circuit, three track circuit, 25th Street Fairgrounds in Columbus, Bloomington, and Paragon Speedway. Bob Kenzer, 1967 to 70, Sheldon Kenzer, 1971, Dick Gaines, 1972, Butch Wilkerson, 73 and 74, Bob Kenzer in 75, and then this upstart punk named Steve Kenzer was a champion in 1976. But, but think about those names. I mean, you, th you, you think about these people. I mean, they're legendary. And, and, you know, it goes back to something that, that I saw said about what Diz Wilson meant. Diz Wilson, there was someone that said, if there's no Diz Wilson, there's no Kensers. You know, and, 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 and in terms of setting the stage here in Bloomington. Brad, you know, we've all, how many of us have a Bob Kenzer story, right? I mean, they're, they're a mile long, and you told that story, and, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself that well, we had a pretty good local racer, raced a lot of Kokomo named Tony Jarrett, right? And, and Tony's son, who raced for a while, actually won a USAC feature event. Tony was just a great guy and raced to Kokomo. Well, you know, he ran afoul of Bob in hot laps. And, and he, Whoops, says, do he says, Bob comes down, saunters down. And you know the old story. If he drops a cigar, you run. But Bob, Bob just came down, and he patted on the rear tire here and said, now, son, I want you to take a seat right here. And so Tony Sarah sits down, and he says, Son, how much do hot laps pay? And, and Tony goes, nothing, Mr. Kinzer. And he says, uh-huh. He goes, lesson delivered, and it's the last one, right? 
And even when we were, uh, you know, uh, you know, Bob was still racing regularly when, when we got involved. And it was funny. It, you know, like some new guy would come into town. He'd have his trailer and all that. He'd be real happy. And he'd go, hey, that's a really good place there to park my rig. And he'd pull in there and somebody would kind of saunter him and go, uh, that's Bob's spot. <laughs> you might want to pull it out somewhere else. And, and he definitely ruled, as all these uh, drivers did that were here to honor at the Blue Minute Speedway. Pat, I was uh, doing a quick little look. You know, uh, a couple other stadiums that are very well known were built just before the Bloomington Speedway, both Fenway Park and Wrigley Field, two great baseball places. Uh, they were built just a few years before Bloomington Speedway was built in 1923. And the historic Hinkle Fieldhouse was built about 10 years after the Bloomington Speedway. And when you think of the people that played for those teams, um, I put our drivers up against their stars. I put ours against, you know, you've got the Bay Bruce and, the, and all the people for the Red Sox and the Yankees and things. Uh, I put our Kensers, I put our uh, Mitchells, I put all of our stars uh, against them any point because of what they mean to us and, and how our sport continues to love them uh, even through today. And it is an amazing list. And the list just continues to grow with some of our stars that we have with us now. Right, there's no question about that. And you know, we'll, we'll certainly move to some of those stars, but to, just to dwell a little bit on, on, on the names we've just mentioned. I mean, you know, Dick Gaines was Steve Kinzer before Steve Kinzer. I mean, that was Carl's driver. I mean, he won the Little 500 and the Knoxville Nationals. And that's an amazing double. Very few people have been able to do that. And obviously, we've seen Dickie, who's come on and won a couple of championships at Bloomington Speedway. And he's got a kid who's starting to race now. But we know what, you know, Butch Wilkerson has done, and, and Bob Kinzer, and these individuals. And the other thing that I do want to mention real quickly, and we'll talk about this more, but Steve Bolin and Bob Fleetwood. They were South Central Indiana Racing Association stock car champions. And stock cars and modifieds and the other forms of racing are as big a part of what happens at Bloomington Speedway and have been for years. Because here's one of the things that I think has always been really important was, you know, a lot of the sprint car drivers. And I, at some point, I just want to name some of the drivers who have won sprint car championships at Bloomington Speedway. Um, it's a big deal. You come in from Bloomington Speedway, you race, and we see the haulers going back from Indianapolis and Brownsburg and Amon to this day. And we have some here in Bloomington, obviously. Brady Short and Kevin Briscoe had a lot of championships pretty close to us here. But the stock car guys and the, the Hornets and the Modified, you know what? Those are your neighbors. I mean, those are people that you work with. Those are people that live in your neighborhood. Those are people who come home after work and work on those race cars. They take it really seriously, and they work really hard to do really well. And this is something, for example, you know, Brad and I both have worked for the United States Auto Club off and on for a long time. This is something some of my brethren at USAC don't really understand all that well, which is I, 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 I tried to tell my buddy Dick Jordan, the late Dick Jordan one time, I said, Dick, I don't know how to tell you this, but there are people down at Bloomington Speedway they care just as much about what, pick a name, what Scott Patman does or Denny Campbell or a member of the Arthur family or the Hobbs family or the Harris family, the Moss, the Moss family. They care as much about what happens there. And I can tell you right now from my perch in the booth, the same people sit in the same spots and they have year after year after year after year. And where they go is Bloomington Speedway. If, if USAC comes in, well, that's great. Uh, and, and has USAC been important to the growth of Speedway? There's no question about that. But I think sometimes in the larger context, particularly when you want to understand what a racetrack means to a community, it means something to the community because not only do these people around here race, they own businesses. They work in businesses. You see them during the week. You wonder how they did. And to me, that's what keeps a racetrack vibrant. That's why I'm such a proponent of weekly racing, because it's what keeps the sport alive. You know, and this racetrack is, has been through its trying times, as you will know. Well, it has. And, and as I drove in today, Pat, you're talking about some of those businesses. And, and those of you that live in Bloomington, I feel like when I drive through all these different businesses on my way here from the west side of Indianapolis and I get to Bloomington, I can almost name what car that sponsor was tied to. You know, when I go by Bloomington Auto Sale or Auto Salvage, 
Well, that's Jerry Shields. You know, JB Salvage Recycle Center. That's our B Main and Jerry Shields and all the different people. I can go through these different businesses that have sponsored and owned and continue to do today. The point? Well, some people think of one thing. I think of Rodney Ritter and Sheldon Kinzer. <laughs> I don't think what people down Lake Monroe think of at the point. Uh, to me, uh, those are the race cars that I remember uh, so very well. And uh, you still drive through town. I did smile as I was coming in, knowing we were celebrating the 100th year. There was a furniture store, and I saw the sign as I was sitting down there right by the McDonald's driving here today. Uh, proud that they've been in business for 93 years in the Bloomington area. I thought, well... <laughs> We're seven years ahead of them. We've been here for 100, and we're going to continue to grow and, and be a big part of this community. And, and uh, I don't know how many more businesses could brag that they've been a business consecutively running for 100 years as the Bloomington Speedway can. And it continues to bring business in every Friday night to this town, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's the gas stations, a lot of our businesses. I also passed Bland's place. Of course, he made top wings for years. You had to run a top wing if you were going to be a big time star in wing racing. And of course, Larry himself, an awfully good racer at the Bloomington Speedway. But so many businesses had connections, home builders, construction workers, uh, cement. I mean, it, I think every house had to be uh, put together by some of our racers with all the uh, cement work and brick work that was done in this area. So, so many different ties uh, bring all of us together. And, um, and, and it's so impressive. It's so much fun and, and fortunate to be a part of it. You know, one of the things that I, I would mention at this point, and, and we, we joked with Mike Miles earlier because, you know, Mike looks great. Um, you know, Mike's not getting, not, Mike's not taking crap on social media. He, he was lucky. He got out before He got out. Media. He got on the tail end. Yeah. He's not taking calls and, and, and complaints and, and all that. It, it's a tough, tough business. I mean, you know, everybody remembers the promoter when the cars are on that auxiliary lot across Fairfax Avenue. They don't remember when the decision was made to run the race and it's 52 degrees and it looks like it's going to rain and the wind's blowing 15 miles out of the north and you just took a bath at the concession stand. You know, they, that's like, that gets forgotten in terms of what this did. And, and I know I don't have all the names of people who ever promoted here, uh, but the Bloomington Speedway Company is often listed, which I assume is a, a conglomerate of the first owners of the racetrack. Roscoe Brewington, Zach Bechtel, Bob Taylor um, was a promoter here. Clyde Lawrence, Jim Mitchell, Carl Kinzer was involved. Doug tells me now, now uh, he, I'm going to make him make him own up this story because I don't want an angry call from Carl, but he, he tells me that when there was an attempt to revive the track at one point when it was a little morbid, that Carl Kinzer, Jerry Shields, and Denny Rutherford all put in $2,000 to reopen, correct? And Carl apparently had $4,000 in the bank, and he took out $2,000 to reopen Bloomington Speedway. And the story goes that when he got home, he had some splaining to do. <laughs> But, but, you know, and Carl ultimately served as the president of the SCIRA board. Bob Deschamps, you know, Lawrence Fox, we mentioned, Denny Richardson with Mike Miles, and Mike and Judy. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on Mike and Judy because Mike was my boss for so many years. But, you know, one of the turning points came. I could have brought this up at any point, but Mike will remember this. Um, Ken Evans, uh, who ran Bloomington Speedway, called a meeting in Martinsville, Indiana, in a Waffle House or some sort of breakfast place. And Mike was there, and I, I, can't, I think Judy might have been there. Keith and Judy Ford were there. Uh, Dick Jordan, uh, the late Dick Jordan, the late Bill Marvel, and I were there. And, and Kent was pitching the idea of bringing Indiana Sprint Week, which was an existing series under the USAC banner. Um, and it began with three races, at Bloomington, Paragon, and Kokomo Speedway. Brad Marvel... Uh, Bill's son won his only USAC event, the finale at Kokomo Speedway, when a big, big moment for him. And that just turned out to be an absolute boom. I mean, that turned everything around for that event. And now it's motorhome heaven and people from all across the country. It garners lots and lots of attention. It's a big deal. But so we had an influx of drivers from California in the early days, particularly. Ron Shimon had started the Sprint Car Racing Association. And their stars, he made way on their schedule for those stars to come. So we're talking the gas man, Richard Giffen, Corey Cruzman, Mike Kirby. Rip Williams didn't come that often, but Steve Osling did, and Mike English, and 
Troy Rutherford, uh, Randy, Ronnie Argo off the top of my head. It was a big deal. Now, there was a rivalry. I mean, J.J. Yaley was between worlds, and this became a really big deal. And so I'm not going to tell the track, but, but we went to a couple of tracks, and they weren't exactly pristine. Let's just put it that way. In fact, one of them, Mike Kirby drew his number for qualifying, and he went back to his pit and said, load the car up. He, he just quit right on the spot because he didn't think he could make it. But I was at Bloomington Speedway, and there was a guy named Richard Harvey. He owned a chassis, he still made a chassis called Stinger Chassis in California. And he stopped me. He, I guess he sort of knew who I was. And he says, just look around. And he says, this is a man who has pride in this place. I'll never forget him saying that. This is a man who has pride in this racetrack. And I, you know, Mike, I just think that was so true. Uh, the way you, the way you kept it up and, and and kept it nice and we appreciated that. You got to give Willard Colfax a little bit of help. I mean, oh, he, Willard! He, Willard Motors for Cat. those of you who don't know the story, yeah. they go to Bloomington Speedway. This is an inside joke, and it's a it's a joke I've I've told for years. There was a guy named Willard Colfax who mowed the grass, and he did routinely. And he would come up and ask us if he did a good job. And we'd say yes. And I'd see him down at Salem Speedway. He'd, he'd be in the infield, and his, his shirt would be off. And I'd talk to Willard. So for any of you who have ever heard me say when a car goes to the infield, he's pulled into the Willard Colfax Memorial Infield. That's what that story is about. And I've continued it to this day. Uh, obviously, Dan and Brenda Roberts, Bruce Lear of Lear Motorsports, and Dale Dillon of Dillon Racing ran the track for a while. USAC took over the track for one year with Levi Jones. Uh, I know David Mitchell did a whole lot of work on the racetrack, and then our current promoters, uh, Joe and Jill Spiker. And Joe and Jill, beyond the fact that they've turned Lincoln Park Speedway around, in my personal opinion, uh, and stepped into Bloomington Speedway, I think they deserve a lot of credit for saving Paragon Speedway when it was on the block and it looked like it was going to go away. And they stepped in to Paragon Speedway, and that wasn't something that exactly allowed them to take trips to the Caribbean every year, uh, but they made that work. But you cannot, um, you know, uh, think of a racetrack without thinking about the people who actually took the risk and the effort to actually put events on. So I did want to say a word about them. And, and to go along with that, and I know many of you know, there's so many of the employees that have been regulars with us. You know, we've got Rusty and Lori Nunn, and of course Rusty is, to me, the finest flagman we've had in Indiana, now director of of uh, you know the racetracks and keeps control of things but you know we've got so many our ticket takers for years were the same ticket takers and they probably remembered you when you walked up there to say hi and many of them of course Doug's wife is still up I hope you visit her Friday night up on the hill when you check in and they're always so pleasant and, and happy and, and that's because we love being where we are but it takes the entire group and I go to a lot of other places and this is I mean it could be another sport and it seems like there's different people there every couple of weeks and there's no consistency. And one of the things I think at racetracks, we have to have that consistency to go along with the tradition, to go along with the understanding. And boy, we have that at the Blooming at Speedway and we have for years. It continues. And as Pat said, the, the, uh, the hill on turn four, you know, some people have their exact same spot that they've parked their truck at for years. And don't you dare take that spot. And then, you know, we built the new grandstand, but the old grandstands, which were the most comfortable to walk up and down, I'm sure all of you enjoyed those <laughs> steps. I, I, hold on a second, I gotta pull the splinter out of the backside there. But, um, you know, huge improvement with where we are uh, from way back then. But everybody has, as Pat said, their, their favorite spot that they yeah. sit in. And please don't take that spot, because that's where they belong and, and that's where they wanna watch their racing from. Yeah, it's really interesting. I have some films of Living Speedway from right after World War II. And, and some of the same people are still in the seat. They're, they're, they're on the hillside in lawn chairs. It's the same. I mean, that's, that's basically been the same in the MO for, for a long time. Brad, just, to, just to, as we, we talk about uh, some of the series, this is something that a lot of people, I think, uh, don't know. Uh, I don't mean that to sound pejorative, but it, 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 it's just the facts. USAC, United States Auto Club, for it much of its early existence would not run sprint car a race on a track uh, less than a half mile in distance. That was by rule, okay? And, and they brought in to be the supervisor, Don Peabody from California. He worked with the California Racing Association. And he was the one who was setting things in motion to say, 
let's loosen that up. It was, it was Bill Lipke at Kokomo who was constantly nipping at the heels to say, why can't we have a USAC sprint car racing? Don was one of the USAC officials killed in the tragic pl plane crash. Um, ultimately, if I remember correctly, it was supposed to be a Kokomo, the first one. Ultimately, the first race of less than a half mile was in Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, it's, it's one of the more interesting things, I think, that people, you know, and, and again, going back to the associations and the different people that race there and, and recognize people for being heroes and what they did, you know, when, and, I, and I've loved history forever, and I loved racing history forever. And I would, I would look at history and I'd go, well, my gosh, Bloomington Speedway's been around since the 20s. They must have ran 100 USAC races there. Well, they didn't, you know. I thought Bob, Bob Kinzer had to have won 50 USAC races. Well, he didn't. He didn't run. He didn't run with USAC all that often. He did win, but he didn't, didn't run that often. The first USAC race ever at Bloomington Speedway didn't occur until 1970. Now, interestingly enough, the winner was Bob Tattersall. Tattersall, Street or Flash. That was his last victory in a, in a midget. Last victory for Bob Tattersall came at Bloomington Speedway. The late Ed Watson, who was a very, very famous uh, publisher, he was a scorer at the time, he scored that particular event. We don't have a USAC sprint car event at Bloomington Speedway until 1982. And who wins it? Rich Fogler. Rich Fogler wins it. We got the Rich Fogler shirt right there in front of you, Pat. We do. There we go. I, I checked the last time I checked in terms of USAC winners of Bloomington Speedway, eight of them are members of the National Sprinkler Hall of Fame. And I can tell you right now, off the top of my head, about four or five guys that are currently racing who are going to be in the Sprint Car Hall of Fame at some point because their record indicates that. So that marriage between USAC and Bloomington Speedway is relatively late, but Brad, it's bared fruit, and certainly it's Indiana Sprint Week has been the marquee event. Well, Indiana Sprint Week, and then of course Midget Week has uh, really followed along suit, has become a fan favorite for so many people because you get to see the midgets and the sprint cars, and of course, as you said, uh, the midgets were the first at Bloomington Speedway. I don't know that there's a better midget track in the country no. to enjoy uh, midgets than, it, than the Bloomington Speedway. And some classic battles between you know Tony Stewart and Russ Gamester early in, in the battles there. We even had the Neymars Nationals that were at the Bloomington Speedway. Um, but midget racing was always an exciting thing with those small little cars and those high-powered engines, and it continues to be exciting to this day. But uh, just so many different crossovers that Indiana Sprint Week, I think, opened up other doors and continues to be a lot of the drivers that we've watched on Sundays right. uh, continue to uh, run well as well. Right. And, and, and just to, to backtrack with the midgets, where did Kyle Larson win his very first USAC event? It was Bloomington Speedway in a midget. True story. He wins the midget race. Keith Kuntz, his car runner, is at the back, right, along the guardrail while, while uh, uh, Kyle's about ready to get interviewed. I'm trying to see, I don't see any young people here so I can say this. So Keith gives me the high sign. He gives me this little look. And I go back there and he says, dude, this kid is bad ass. And I think that's proven to be the fact. The Tony Stewart, I think, Brad, the story, the, that story needs to be told. Uh, Tony Stewart, again, I knew Tony, obviously. I, I followed him here. Um, you know, he, he <laughs> Tony. You know, he, he, he won a midget championship in 1994 for Ralph Potter, then he won the Triple Crown in 1995. But Tony Stewart is, was, was he either in Ralph's? He must have been in Ralph's car. Uh, I don't think he was in Raleigh Helming's car yet. Um, but he's racing Russ games. Brad's got this right. I mean, some of you heard this story. And, you know, Russ was a national midget champion. His family been involved in years. And, 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 and Tony's winning the race. I mean, he's, he's dominant. And there's a yellow flag. It's pretty late in the race, right? And so <laughs> Tony's motoring around. He's out front. Under yellow. Under yellow. And Russ just drifts up to the cushion between three and four and just buzzes his wheel. You know, so we're another lap under yellow. And Russ goes up to the corner. He buzzes the corner. Well, he just knocked the cushion completely away, right? It was one of just, those razor thin knives. Just knocked it away. So here goes the green flag, and there goes Tony. And he's sailing down the back straightaway, and before you know it, he's headed for the irrigation ditch, right? He's 
he's ready to go ass over tea kettle in that irrigation ditch. And so that's part of the story. I mean, Russ won the race, but the yellow comes out, and Tony is hopping mad, right? And he drove so frenetically. I was in the infield to do an interview, and I looked, and Bill Marvel was in the infield, and another USAC official in the infield, and they wouldn't look up. And I almost couldn't stand looking up because I'm going, this kid is going to kill himself. He's so mad. And that son of a gun came back and ran second. Uh, so that was a, a pretty good story about that. But the midgets, you're right. We were early on in Indiana Midget Week, and that made a big difference. You know, and of course, not only with the United States Auto Club, but, Pat, as we looked at all the different sanctioning bodies and the amazing list of winners, I mean, I know many of us were there, whether it was with the World of Outlaws, the All-Stars, the Gum Out series that we had that was part of it. It just continues uh, to be an amazing list of winners that uh, we could stack up the Bloomington Speedway with any racetrack, the Eldoras, the Knoxvilles, those gentlemen that uh, are heralded at those tracks. Uh, they've wanted our track as well. And many of them will tell you it was a more hard-earned win than at those bigger tracks. Uh, we've had several drivers get out after 30 wing laps, and they are out of breath, dead tired. So that's the hardest I've raced in years. And this track, Bloomington Speedway, demands that out of you. There isn't a time to take a little break. There isn't a time to take a deep breath. Uh, early in my career, one of the first things I had to do at Bloomington Speedway, and I can't believe Mike Miles ha asked me to do this, I scored a World of Outlaw race. And this was long before transponders. So I'm trying to write down 24 cars in less than nine seconds. Um, right. I and that's what they were going. Yeah, they were right at nine seconds. I think I got most of them. Luckily, <laughs> probably, uh, um, oh, what was Judy's sister's name? Tammy. Tammy. Tammy uh, was probably a much better scorer than me and was getting all the cars down. I was just thankful we didn't have too many yellows because, uh, wow, that was a heck of a job trying to score and write down all those cars. If you've never scored, by the way, uh, show up this Friday night at Bloomington Speedway, get a piece of paper, and try to write the cars down as they go by every single lap and keep track of that. That is a nightmare. Thank goodness for transponders these days, which makes it uh, a little more uh, easy to do. But the world of outlaws, the all-stars, Pat, uh, they packed the Bloomington Speedway. And um, it was important for those series to come to our racetrack and be participants there because Bloomington Speedway was so well thought of as a place that if you won, uh, you could race anywhere against anybody. Yeah, so I jotted down some of the winners of the World of Outlaw Races. Okay, I mean, just, just listen to this list. Steve Kinzer. Shock face, right? <laughs> Sammy Swindell, Doug Wolfgang, Rick Furkle, Bobby Allen, Dave Blaney, Stevie Smith, Donnie Schatz. The only one on the list that's not in the Hall of Fame is Donnie Schatz. Anybody think Donnie Schatz is going to be in the Hall of Fame? Uh, I, I'll, I'll lay a little money on that. Uh, a, a amazing list of drivers. And, 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 which, and again, you know, what the world of Outlaws is today and what it was when Bloomington Speedway hosted them are two different things. I mean, they were also getting a foothold across the country. And you can't deny the fact that they brought interest in spring, in spring car racing in places that here before. I lived in Humboldt, Kansas. Now, there's a racetrack there now, and some people know that racetrack now because they actually have some national events. This is a true story. I, I lived there. I worked in a community mental health center. And I went to go to like the TSA farm store, whatever that was, to, to buy something one Saturday afternoon. And I had a Brad Doty t-shirt on. And somebody said, what kind of race car is that? And I said, well, it's a sprint car. Well, now they all know what, what sprint cars are. Brad, the All-Stars, interestingly enough, for a number of years when Mike was there, uh, we, we would sometimes run that stock car classic maybe at the last race of the year. But we ran a big all-star race to really conclude the year. Yeah, trying to wrap up the fall season and had music afterwards. It was always a huge bash with the all-stars that were there. But, uh, you know, the Emix, uh, Bert, Bert Bridget, Bridget. loved to come to the Bloomington Speedway. And, and again, just a proving ground uh, for their drivers over the years to bring the all-stars there. And I'm happy to see that they're making a rebound and maybe someday we'll get them back a little bit. But I don't know. The, you know, you look at the, the history of Bloomington Speedway, I think a lot of our, all of you, understand um, but many people probably don't know there was a lot of years we were a wing racetrack the whole time and then we split to where part of our events were wing and non-wing I think the final year John Stanbro and the Law Brothers 77 
picked up a win in a wing car and a non-wing car uh, driving for the Law Brothers. And by the way, the Law Brothers, uh, uh, the Kenoki boy, a lot of... We'll Elijah. Up. Elijah is another of the 14-year-old stars that's on his way up, a similar paint scheme. But, uh, you know, we did have a lot of those years in the original Indiana Sprint Weeks when Chuck Amati and Gary Trammell tied some kid named Tate was turning the wrenches on that car <laughs> and owning it. Uh, Daryl was great with those cars. They, they were co-champs. Uh, but, again, we had a lot of years early. Indiana Sprint Week was some of the tracks were wing, some were non-wing, and, and we still crowned a champion. We did. And that's been a big part of it. Brad, All-Stars? Let's talk about some All-Star winners, why don't we? Frankie Kerr, Bobby Allen, Gary Wright from Hooks, Texas. Just down the road. Yeah. <laughs> I told that story on Friday night at Knoxville this year, and um, Gary Wright, who's had such a remarkable career, one of the greatest questions I heard or comments I heard him make was, he says, that Texas X, and he'd say, people ask me why I race so long, and I just told him, well, I just liked it. <laughs> <laughs> you like things when you're good at it. Joey Saldana, Ricky Hood, hooker's boy, who not only did well with the wings, but was a USAC champion. The dude, Danny Lasowski, the incredible Jack Hewitt, Steve Kenzer, Kelly Kenzer running that race car right down there at the bottom of the racetrack and making it sing, and Bobby Davis Jr. Folks, I'm gonna say it again. These are legendary race drivers that have won and raced here at Bloomington Speedway. That's what makes this 100th anniversary to me so incredibly special. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll get those individuals back. You know, another part of it, too, the town of Bloomington and our track has also had an unbelievable number of great mechanics and car builders. Of course, you had to run a Mitchell chassis for a lot of years if you were going to win races. Um, but, you know, the Galen Fox, and we want to make sure we continue to keep Galen in our thoughts and hopefully... Uh, can get him a little healthier. Um, we, we spoke of Jerry Shields, a great friend of my dad's, and he often ran my dad's competition welding cars there in the 70s and 80s and, and until he uh, ended up racing with Todd and Troy there at the end. But uh, so many of the mechanics were also uh, so valuable and important to making this sport what it is today, and they just did a great job building engines, building chassis, uh, just being very intelligent with how to set up a chassis in a car. I watch a lot of our people today and they try to go look at everybody else's cars to see what they're doing you know what's the setup look like what tires are they running the drive the guys i just mentioned they never looked at anybody else's they knew what they were doing they knew exactly what they needed for their driver and when they came in they told their driver exactly what needed to be done and if not they'd pull the old diz wilson and you'd have a new driver in the seat of that car the next week yeah you see daryl will appreciate this and other people brad and i it's one of my favorite stories. Brad and I announced at Pikes Peak International Raceway. We're on a plane home, and Brad's on the aisle, and right across the aisle is the legendary Jim McQueen, mechanic. And so I think, did he have Tracy Hines? I think Tracy, Tracy Hines, Hines was Tracy his, Hines was driving. He Tracy, was supposed to go down and beat up that guy, but yeah, he didn't. Yeah, he yeah, had Dad driving. Yeah. But anyway, but Tracy Tracy is his driver, and uh, so many of you knew Jim. He was a man of sort of few words, and so... Brad's talking. You know, Brad's really gregarious. I mean, he's naturally gregarious. He, he'll, he'll talk to anybody at the gas station and, and to, to strike up a conversation. I'm, I'm, I really am a little more shy. But um, so Brad turns to Jim McQueen and says, "Hey, you know, you got Tracy Hines." And he, yeah. And he goes, he goes, does he give you good feedback? And Jim McQueen's sitting there and he just goes. I don't want any feedback. <laughs> I just want him to mash the pedal. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's what those mechanics want and those car owners want. So many different... Pat, you earlier brought up the name Brewer. Uh, we have so many new young drivers, the Brewer family, of course, and I got a great picture. Doug sent me a picture the other day when it, with his the uh, elder Brewer when they started racing with the Pete. Cadillac engine right. in there that Bob Kenzer first started running an awful lot for and then on to Sheldon. But now maybe even his great-grandson, the 14-year-old, has been on a tear in the mini sprint. So you can find, you know, we've seen uh, Dickie Gaines' son has started racing yeah. this year. The third, second, third, fourth uh, uh, tradition of family members, of course, in the back there, we, we've got uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Nate, uh, Nat Hill the fourth back there with us. Yes, we do. There's a lot of different second, third, and fourth generation, whether it's the drivers or, in my case, you know, with my dad, uh, who make this sport so important, and it just continues to live on. Yeah, and, and you know, Jerry Brewer's son, J.L. Brewer, was a racer with the TQ Midgets for a number of years, drove a number 14. He's a big, tall kid, like all the Brewers are, and Brian has won three races in a row now 
Uh, and it, that's right. It sort of it keeps that tradition going. And uh, along that way, uh, given a point that uh, I tried to make earlier, a lot of people forget this. I mean, we know what Sheldon Kinzer did, right? We know what he did in terms of USAC championships. We know what he did in Silver Crown championships. We know he ran an Indy. We know he's a Hall of Famer. Won 37 USAC sprint car features in his career. But but Sheldon Kinzer dominated in stock cars once here at Bloomington Speedway. He won stock car races. That's where he started. Uh, you know, so again, uh, while we sometimes focus on that part of it, uh, there are other people that uh, certainly made their mark at Speedway on the series. I know early in our career, Pat, uh, a young 13-year-old had raced there a year or two before we got there. But for many years, and I'm sure you remember, our Rookie of the Year was named the Jeff Gordon uh, Rookie of the Year. And that was so important. People wanted to come win the Jeff Gordon Rookie of the Year and, in fact, showed up his rookie season when he made it to the Cup and, and signed autographs. Uh, I think it was supposed to be for two hours, about an hour and a half. The line was really long, and he came up a little tired, had some commitments, and the line was enormously long, and they were contemplating making their way out. And uh, a nice reminder that he needed to make sure he continued to sign <laughs> autographs from me. I got him to go back down he did. there. Yes. And, uh, but, you know, there have just been a lot of our stars in recent years. We've already talked to Kyle Larson and Jeff Gordon and Ryan Newman and Tony Stewart. The list would, continues. And I look forward to seeing – uh, who that next person's going to be. I think we're definitely getting an opportunity to see some of those stars that might be that next group that moves forward that we watch on Sundays. Uh, if you watch on Sundays, I know a lot of us, Friday and Saturday nights at the dirt track is exactly where we want to watch most. You know, Brad, just, just to, to to also not always dwell on the national stuff, but, you know, I've, I've, I've compiled a list the best I can as, as some of the track champions we've had at Bloomington over the years, and even going back to Paragon with Alan Barr and Danny Bolin and, and Frank Hollingsworth, Larry Miller, uh, Rex Mitchell, uh, drivers of that nature. But, you know, like at Bloomington, uh, Bobby Black, Russ Petro in a stock car, Kelly Kinzer, Ernie Barrow, Mike Johnson, Greg Staub, the dog, was a, was a weekly champion here, Jim Ruddick, Mike Gibbs, Andy Hillenberg, Harka champion, ultimately made it to the Indianapolis 500, still very much involved. Denny Campbell, who I thought was just a tremendous race driver, um, got in a sprint car a few times and did incredibly well. The great Kevin Huntley, you know, who who uh, you know was an all-star champion, had those great battles with Frankie Kerr. A lot of people may not know this, but when uh, Jill and Joe uh, revamped the racetrack, uh, he was hugely involved with his excavating company uh, and was a sponsor and was very much involved in the 305s. I mean, you know, a, a guy who just just gave us a lot in the sport. You know, you didn't want to forget him. How many track championships did Randy Kinzer win? Oh, my God. He won tons of track championships throughout the area. Uh, Ray Godsey, Larry Harris, Jeff Gordon, champion. Chuck Amati, champion, Bloomington Speedway. Larry Harris, Kenny Harden, Gary Trammell, Albert Webb, Jay Deckard. Kevin Briscoe, a five-time champion. Brian Clawson couldn't beat Kevin Not Briscoe. Me. Couldn't beat him for years. Kevin Briscoe uh, snookered Brian Clawson race after race. And the first time Brian Clawson beat him may be the most important step in his career. I think that, there was like that, almost three straight Friday nights that Brian right. Clawson was leading late. And right. we'd have a yellow with a lap or two to go. Right. And you could almost see through his helmet, oh, Briscoe's behind Here he comes. Again. Right. And he'd get him every dag on He time. sure did. And it was an amazing run. Uh, for both, to watch Brian grow up and, of right. course, to always watch Kevin Briscoe race right. was special in itself. And, uh, by the way, Chase's car, the one I think is midget, might be on display tomorrow uh, as the car show tomorrow afternoon is here with some of the great cars. The Burton cars will be here tomorrow. Um, Andy Bradley. How many of you have seen Andy's brand-new car? I know, Pat, it's you got pretty. a little more there. Oh, it's beautiful, a yellow yeah. 49. Looks like a Blackie Fortune a car. Blackie Fortune-looking yeah. car. So a lot of cars tomorrow. Right. I hope people can make it out. I think uh, 6 o'clock start time. Is that right? Yeah, so hopefully everybody gets here tomorrow right. and brings some young kids to, to watch that. Pat, you got some more chances? Yeah, I do. I just want to mention some of these people. And, I, and again, it's not complete, and, and we need to complete it. I mean, that's, the, you know, I, I, have, I have gaps in the 30s that are pretty important to fill, uh, and I have gaps even in the 60s that are really important. Albert Webb, Jr., Jay Deckard, Scott Patman. Scott Patman just had some tremendous years. When I first came, he was nearly unbeatable in the post stocks. Todd Shields. Uh, Nate Law, who remembers Nate Law? Nathaniel Law from Kentucky. He was a champion when we ran mini sprints. There's old Randy Kinzer showing up against Kevin Thomas, the Kevin Thomas, the original Alabama Kevin Thomas. 
Kevin Thomas, you know, in my opinion, in terms of traditional sprint car racing, the Dave Darlin, Tony Elliott, and Kevin Thomas era is what revitalized traditional sprint car racing in Indiana and beyond. And when we would have a non-winger race, when Bloomington was a wing race, Kevin Thomas was the man to beat. For a while, every time the Indiana Sprint Week was all non-wing, Kevin Thomas was the champion. I think sometimes I'm concerned he gets overlooked. Matt Boatneck, still very... Dale Dubois, Derek Davidson. I don't know how many of you know this, but Derek Davidson was the car chief on Takumo Sato's last Indianapolis 500 win. He's been a car chief in Indianapolis now for years. For years. He made a career. Got injured at Terre Haute. Kind of sidelined his career. He's been fantastic. Uh, Buddy Cunningham. We just lost Buddy. Many of you know Josh from uh, Paragon and what he continues to do. Don't we get cookies about right now? Yeah, we did. Well, his the family Cun always Cunningham would bring us, uh, cookies. Mrs. Bring us cookies right. every Friday night, right. and they were mm, tasty. Brad, I, I was skinny before I met them. <laughs> Brad Fox. You know, people forget that. Brad Fox was the track champion. A.J. Boland. He just wasn't a realtor. He was a darn good... A modified driver. Derek Scheffel, a great guy. Had some great years and sort of concentrated on his career. Matt Tiller, Perry Bruce, Lee Hobbs. How many races did Lee Hobbs win? And Chris LaFala, uh, who had some pretty good years. Adam Sasser, uh, Greg O'Neill, Matt Boatneck, I get on mention. So you get the point. Uh, Greg Kendall, Hobbs and Boatneck. Jack Fry. How many years have we watched Jack Fry race? Shelby Miles, uh, a track champion. Uh, Brady Short in Modifieds and then the all-time leader in terms of championships in sprint cars. Ben Dubois, Jesse Kramer, Danny Harris, Kent Robinson. How good has Kent been over the years, and how much has his family been? Jeremy Hines, uh, Dickie Gaines. Dickie Gaines, track champion here. So you get my point. I just think that all these people also deserve our praise and attention um, because, again, they put forth the effort to come out and race. Uh, and sometimes a great sacrifice. I mean, we all have learned this over the years. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes when you you, you you quit going to the racetrack for a couple of weeks, you go, you mean there's other things in life than going to the racetrack? Uh, because sometimes it can get to you. But, you know, Brad, I, as, I, as, we, as we reflect on that, I think some of the races and some of those people were as memorable as some of the headlining groups. Oh, without a doubt. And that's what's made Bloomington so special. And, you know, you talk about... Danny Holtzclaw and John Sisko in recent years, not too far back. And it, now Sydney Chambers, following after her father, Kevin, continues to race well and was the Hart Rookie of the Year, the Billy Marvel Rookie of the Year. That's what makes it all so special. And, and to me, it's the true family sport. Um, you know, they're just, you sit next to that person and you feel them clapping for that guy in the Hornet race or the Superstock race, and all of a sudden you're clapping and cheering for him too because you want to see him do well. You know the, you know the sacrifices that they've made to get there on that Friday night. And then you feel bad for them when you see their car get torn up because we know what that means. Uh, we're going to have to work some overtime. We're going to have to ask the neighbor next to us, hey, can you help me out just a little bit? And many of you that are here have reached in your pocket and helped in many different ways. You've turned wrenches. You've sat in the garage till 2 in the morning, turning wrenches, telling stories, listening to music, drinking a beer. That sounds good to me right now, by the way. Um, so, you know, that uh, those that's what makes our sport uh, it's so awesome, and, and we're fortunate to be a part of it. And I know, Pat, we could go on forever, but, uh, you know, we can't go on forever, but there's a couple more. Well, there's a couple things I do want to mention. I think that's important to mention is is that uh, it's a racetrack. It, 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 racing is an inherently dangerous sport, and we know that. Um, it's something that we all have had to deal with and reckon with. We've had to cross that boundary to say, you know, uh, why am I involved in something that can cause some harm, but I think we all we all sort of uh, reconciled it. Uh, Oren Lewis, uh, in 1949, uh, died as a result of uh, an accident at Bloomington Speedway. Uh, he lived in the St. Joseph area neighborhood of, in Indianapolis. It was because of Tom helping me with this, Tom Schmay, uh, I learned that he won a, an open competition midget race in 1947 in Rushville, Indiana, a racetrack that I didn't know existed and it is not in Alan Brown's history of the American Speedway. So we lost Oren Lewis in 1949. 1974, Robert Bunzelmeyer lost his life. He was a sponsor, really, and he owned an Exxon station in Cincinnati. He was really sort of subbing uh, for his driver just temporarily. He lost his life. Calvin Gilstrap, many of you knew Calvin, 1976, a 30-year veteran of the sport. Uh, 
um, ultimately thought that that might be his final year of the sport. We lost another great veteran in Mike Waltz in 1978. Uh, the Waltz family has been very involved in racing for years. And what are we doing Friday night? We're celebrating Josh Burton. Josh, uh, you know, this is, a, this is the perfect example of this racetrack because these are, these are people of us. These are people that are a part of the culture of the racetrack and part of the culture of this community. For those of you who didn't know Josh, he was a happy-go-lucky sort of happy guy. Um, and I'll never forget that in honor of him, we got a bonus on this at Living the Speedway since he always had that bright orange and green car. The drivers all painted Hoosier on their tires orange. And several of the drivers wore orange and yellow or orange and uh, green socks. I remember Dakota Jackson lifted up his legs and showed me the, the orange and green socks. And, the, you know, the family has picked themselves up and continued to race. Uh, Jordan Kinzer won this year for them at Bloomington Speedway. They'll be there with two cars on Friday night in a race that's named in his honor. Um, and I think that's the other part of the sport that's been so important is that, you know, sometimes it's a sport that's under siege. It's a sport that's under siege from people from the outside who don't understand it. They come and they don't hear. Um, they, they don't understand the culture of it. They don't understand how tight the bonds are among people who participate in it and people who are fans and people who are officials. Uh, it's something that you really can't describe particularly well. So, you know, when you have a loss um, as for someone like Josh, it pains you deeply, and you feel a little lesser for the moment for it. Um, but then you pause, and you say, and I know it's trite, and I know people think it's trite, but you'd say to yourself, what would he ask you to do? And what he'd ask you to do is to keep going. Because, you know, and I think about, you know, I think about the Hill family, and I think about, you know, Wiley Kent, and I think about, Lawrence Foxes, I think about the Carl Kinzers, I think about the drivers who we've listed, the drivers that we lost early on, even the Hilton Crouches, no matter what his flaws were. These are individuals who, in what I think is the greatest American spirit, decided to test themselves and their limits and explore that line, that undefinable line between performance and danger and mayhem. And, you know, this country wasn't established and didn't become great because people were meek. This country is great because people were willing to risk and to try and to try to do special things. And to me, you know, I'm a professional educator. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I, I write articles for publication in academic journals and I'm, I'm proud of, of, of what I do with that. And I, and then Brad feels that Brad's an excellent coach. He takes it seriously. He's always understood the, the minds of the students that he's worked with. He was telling me about what he went through with his golf team the other day. Uh, getting in there with them to try to, to help them get the best of themselves, not just because of the outcome, but because it's the notion of getting the best of you, whatever that is. And to me, that's always been the essence of auto racing. Those individuals who put it on the line out there in front of people, with an opportunity to fail far more than there's an opportunity to succeed. And to do that in an arena with others watching, to me, that's what's great. And it, it, it reminds me of a story I've told many times. Um, a, a young woman went with me to DeCoin, Illinois. She's actually been involved in the racing business uh, for the Silver Crown race there. And uh, she came up to me. She had been away. Jack Hewitt broke. Jack Hewitt had been running the high side, and his car broke, and she looked at me and said, I'm not going to say exactly what she said because you can figure it out. I said, I think we just might as well leave because Jack Hewitt is the only guy that had the <clears throat> to run up on the high side, right? And I said, they all have that, every single one of them. The person who finished dead last in the B feature by 15 seconds had that. They had guts. And don't ever f forget that. So these individuals we've gone through, whether we're starting with, with the name Butcher to the name Kinzer to the name Wilson to the name Gaines uh, to the name Deckard or Harris or Campbell or all of them, they've all tried to be the best and the greatest they could be at what they do. 
And I think that is worthy personally. That's, that's all <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And we're so lucky to watch it at the Bloomington Speedway. And uh, I, I, we hope that maybe there might be some questions tonight uh, or maybe a quick story. I know we've been sitting for a while, and as a school teacher, I know this exceeds all of my teaching rules. We're not supposed to have kids sit for more than 30 minutes without getting them to move in some way. So if you need to wiggle for just a second, I know a couple of you made the trip to the restroom, but if anybody has a, a question or a quick comment that they would like to make, this would be a perfect time for, for that to be done. Don't be shy. Yeah. Well, Pat, no, go ahead. You've got so many races, and I know it's hard to pick, but what's your favorite? Oh. What mean the famous favorite favorite race we ever saw? Absolutely. Oh wow! You know, I think if I could, Bob Kinzer won that USAC show. Yeah. So emotional. Yeah, when he won that, I know a night that I thought it was going to be when I oh. thought Kevin Huntley was going to win the World of Outlaw race, and yeah. daggone it, we had that red flag, yeah. and and that changed the whole outcome because no red or no yellow, Kevin Huntley wins the World of Outlaw race at the Bloomington Speedway, you know, and they're just, there's just so many uh, different ones. It's kind of hard for me to. I, I have one actually okay. that it comes to mind actually. And it's, it's an interesting one. Here's one reason why I made the joke about, you know, the Kansas Jayhawks. The fact of the matter is I can hardly stand to watch Kansas Jayhawk basketball. I just, it's just like, I, I have to remind myself that this was supposed to be fun. You know, I, I believe that if I get up and go to another room or turn the television off that, uh, the score will turn around, and if they lose, I'm aggravated for the next four and a half hours. I'm a fan of the Kansas City Royals. I deal well with aggravation. So, good. so, you know, in other sports, I really care who wins, right? I do. But rarely in racing do I care, because I like everybody. I mean, I remember a, a guy named Bob Hopp who ran it, raced in, in Knoxville for years. He was from Minnesota. We took him out to dinner once on a late race at Knoxville, and he said that one thing he noticed about sprint car fans is they like everybody. So you don't have that, you know, I mean, I know there was Sammy and Steve stuff and all that, but you know, we, we all like everybody. So I like everybody, and I don't care who wins for the most part, for the most part. But I remember we were at, at, at Bloomington, and, you know, I've known Dave Darnold a long time. I mean a long time, right? And so, and I love Dave Darlin. Uh, I just do. I mean, I took a trip with Dave Darlin. Dave Darlin and I, I'll try to make this quick. I, I, get, I get sidetracked. Dave Darlin, I, I announced a race at the Fargo Dome in North Dakota. Dave Darlin and I drove out there. He's got a van that's got 215,000 miles on it. And I said, I'm glad I'm with you, Dave, because this thing breaks down and you can fix it. I went smart enough and he goes, Pat, I don't know how to fix this thing. And I go, holy cow. And, 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 and the stories that Dave Darling told in that story were just, just <laughs> so funny. But, but Dave, you know, is so incredibly popular. And um, so the night he won his 60th USAC race, um, I was working with Kim Stewart, and Kim said, and she was supposed to go down and do the interview. And she says, do you want to do this interview? And I said, yeah, I do. And so it was over. And again, I, you know, I try to be completely neutral in these things. And it was over. Dave put his hand up in the air for a high five. And, and Rich Foreman, the USAC photographer, got the side of me high five and Dave uh, Darlin. And I thought, this is two old war horses uh, who are from a particular era. And this was Dave Darlin's 60th USAC. I mean, and I just watched it. Uh, that was personally meaningful to me. Any other questions or comments? Yes, go ahead. I saw Steve Kinzer win a World of Outlaws feature at Middleton Speedway. It's one of the few times I can drive. And the impression has stayed with me the whole time. He was, of course, very, very fast. But even more than that, he was so incredibly smooth. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. You know, Steve Kinzer, um, I, I meant to I make, this, make this statement earlier. I mean, do you realize that, again, if we looked at the three top sanctioning bodies for auto racing and sprint cars in America today, it's the World of Outlaws, the All-Star Circuit Champions, and USAC. 
you realize the champions of those series have all been from Bloomington, Indiana. All of them. I mean, all of them. And in, in, um, in, the, in the 25th anniversary of the Knoxville Nationals, a poll was conducted about who was the greatest sprint car driver of all time. And Steve Kinzer won by a landslide. And I still think he's the greatest sprint car driver I've ever seen. Um, at the Knoxville Nationals one year, and I, I know this is old hat for guys who race cars. I'm always amazed at what they do. But, but Steve Kinzer was dead to rights late in the Na Knoxville Nationals. He's, he's not going to win. And all of a sudden, he starts going like a bat out of hell. And I'm going, holy cow, what happened? And he won. And, um, you know, Steve, who was so, he, he couldn't pry a word at him at one point in his life. And lately, when he's come to Bloomington Speedway, he's just been a tremendous interview. And he certainly got better as he got more comfortable. And he said, I could tell I had a tire that was going low, so I had to figure out how to just crank the car sideways for two consecutive laps and build the air pressure up to where it needed to be so I could hit the button and go, and I'm going, you're going 130 miles an hour on this half mile track and you can think that quick and make that decision. You know, that's one. The other one, by the way, we'll make this the statement, late in Bob Kinzer's career, announced at the Bloomington Speedway and Bob flipped. He completely flipped and he gets on all four wheels and he hustles back in the pit area, makes an adjustment and comes out. And I sat there and I thought, that's why some people race cars and some just watch the darn things, right? Because <laughs> I don't know how he did. Remember this one, Brad? This is, this is, so this is the end of Bob's career. And um, so Randy Kinzer pulls Bob, Brad and I into his trailer at the Tarot Action Track. Says, guys, come here. So we go back in the back of the trailer, and Randy goes, you know, God dang. He goes, Bloomington's gone non-wing again. He says, when that wing's up top, and, you know, creates some downforce, and Dad's sort of straight. And he goes, I don't like that he's in these non-wing cars. They're not stable enough. And, you know, I, I think it's just time. I think it's time. And he says, do you think you guys could talk to Bob? <laughs> about stopping racing and I said I can't say the word I used that night but it was start, but the message was are you out of your mind we're going to tell Bob Kenzer he's done no thanks that's not a job I'm going to take on yeah. we did not but, appreciate you bringing yes up. he was fabulous he, he, he was smooth so yeah. and it, and you've got to be smooth if you want to win at Bloomington Speedway I mean, you got to be fast you got to be brave but you have to be smooth as well and uh, so many of our champions that we've represented and talked about here tonight have that. So, anything else? I just have to say that Steve Kinzer said Bob had set up the storm in my dad's house. Did he? Halfway through, they went pop that, but he was wrong. You <laughs> 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 can't make this stuff up. It's not Steve Jones from Fairy Tale. There you go. But, but Bob Kinzer, I remember I was just a kid and he lay in that snow and I thought, that guy has four arms, hands, and he must be the strongest guy. Tell the Lincoln Park story. I don't want, I don't want to mess with that. Right. Yeah. With the flag at the Lincoln Park, the American flag with Bob. Well, that, now that was a Kokomo. You yeah, talking yeah. about the, the Trophy Dash? Where we... Yeah, so in the Trophy Dash at, at Kokomo and some of you there, but Bob was so strong, you'd watch all the younger drivers. They, they, when you got fast time at Kokomo, you got to hold the American flag outside the convertible pace car. And you'd get all the younger guys, and they'd kind of wedge it under their legs. They didn't have two wheels. We'd take off with Bob and play the National Anthem one-handed. He'd stick that sucker <laughs> out there, and, and it, it's just straight as could be. Bob didn't flinch once. Next week, some punk like a Dave Darlin or Trey House would win. They got, they got both arms, and they're holding on for life. Uh, not Bob. And that cigar, about that long, probably was right there the whole yeah. time. But, uh, wow, haven't we been lucky. Yeah. To be around all these people. One uh, more about that. There, Steve Kinzer. There was an article with Steve Kinzer, in the uh, probably in the eighties. You know, it's when he was, you know, he, he he was the dominant driver early on in the World of Outlaws. Sammy won a couple, then, um, you know, Steve got back on top. But there was an article that said that Steve Kinzer was like in the fourth grade. I don't remember the grade. It was like the fourth grade, and it was one of the classic questions. What does your daddy do? And Steve Kinzer says, my dad is Bob Kinzer. 
He, he drives sprint cars, drinks beer, and likes to fight. <laughs> yep. Isn't that great? <laughs> so, nobody messed with Bob Kids. I mean, I was, you know, the, I mean, so, how many of you knew Bob? You know, uh, Bob Kinzer is a was a funny guy. I mean, he could be hilariously funny. I remember one time I said, Bob, you're looking good. He goes, well, I feel good. I said, well, Mahalia you must be teaching well. He goes, I don't look that good, right? <laughs> but Bob was amazingly funny. But my first years at Bloomington Speedway, I didn't come 35 feet of that trailer. I was scared just walking by the guy, and I wasn't even racing against him. But what, what were we lucky? Oh, you bet. We've been lucky, yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Well, Pat, go ahead. Je I heard one. Go ahead. Well, Did you have a reasonably okay time? <laughs> Good. Good. It has been an absolute privilege. Uh, you know, uh, at my age, I often wonder how long uh, I can do it. And I hope a lot longer. I think until I can't see uh, or I get fired. Uh, it is a, it's a privilege uh, to work at Bloomington Speedway. It's a privilege to be a part of it. And what I want everyone here to understand, particularly if you're not a racing person, is to understand how important this racetrack is to this community. How that racetrack has put this community on the map. How it is a part of the cultural fabric of Bloomington, Indiana. And therefore why we should be talking about Bloomington Speedway in a history center, because it's that important to us. Well, thank you all for coming. Again, tomorrow night, there'll be the car show. We hope you can make it to the car show. And then, of course, on Friday, uh, get out and support the Josh Burton Memorial. It'll be a great night to be at the racetrack and uh, continue to support a wonderful family. And thank you guys that are here for what you've done to make this sport right. so awesome. Yeah, it's, it's great to all see all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys.